Hello, today we'll be talking about linear regression. First, let's go over this lesson's goals. We'll start by learning about the math behind linear regression. Then in R, we'll make a figure for our data set. Then we'll do our linear regression in R. And finally, we'll make an R markdown document to summarize what we did today. Okay, let's start by talking about the math of linear regression. Here's the basic equation for a linear regression. We'll start by breaking it down and understanding each piece of it. yi refers to a specific y value, or your dependent variable. a refers to the intercept of your model, or where on the y-axis your line hits when x is 0. b is the slope, or the change in y for one change in x. xi is a specific x value, or your independent variable. And ei is the random variance, or the residual, for a specific data point. So this is the basic math of a linear regression. But to really understand what's going on, let's look at this equation with a real world example. The data presented here looks at how the weight of baby chicks in grams changes over time. Time here is measured in days. As you can see, there appears to be a positive trend, whereas more time passes, the chicks gain weight. Indeed, we can draw a line that shows this increase. Okay, so to better understand how this line is represented by the equation above, let's pick a specific data point to look at. The first thing to look at for this point are the y and x values. For this particular point, the yi is roughly 140 grams, and the x is roughly 10 days. Now we can look at the a, or the intercept of our line. Based on where our line crosses the y-axis, we can say that at zero days, when x is zero, our chicks weigh roughly 20 grams. Next, we can look at b, or our slope. This value tells us how much weight on average a baby chick gains for each day that passes. And finally, we have our residual. The residual is the difference between the actual y value, here roughly 140 grams, and what the model predicts the y value to be, something closer to 100 grams. Okay, so now you should have a better understanding of what each part of our equation means in a real world example. So far, we've only talked about our equation in regards to continuous predictors, for example, days. But what happens, though, when our x value is categorical? To show you why this is important to understand, let's start by breaking down the a plus bx portion of our equation for both continuous and categorical predictors. For a continuous predictor, x is a set of continuous data points. But for a categorical predictor, x is a set of binary or categorical data points. For a continuous predictor, a is the value of y when x is 0. But for a categorical predictor, a is the value of y when x is the default level of the category. For a continuous predictor, b is the change in y for one change in x. But for a categorical predictor, b is the change in y when x is the non-default level of the category. As before, let's go over this in more detail with a real-world example. Let's take, for example, the data we used in the previous lesson. This figure is one of the figures from the extra materials I posted online. It looks at how reaction times differ between bilinguals with high and low proficiency in their second language, or L2. To understand how to look at this with linear regression, first we need to change our categories, our levels of our categories, high and low, to numbers, 0 and 1. So now our default level, high proficiency, becomes the number 0 in our model, and our non-default level, low proficiency, becomes the number 1 in our model. To further show how this is similar to our continuous predictor example, let's remove the boxes. So now it's just the data points. And also, let's remove the colors. OK, now it looks a lot more like our previous example. As before, the first thing we can do is draw a line that connects our data points. And next, we'll pick a specific point to go over with our equation. First, we look at the y and x values for our chosen data point. It looks like our y value is roughly 1140 milliseconds, and our x value is 1 for the non-default level of the category. Next, we look at our intercept. Remember that for categorical predictors, the intercept is the value of y when x is the default level. In our case, this is roughly 950 milliseconds. Our slope is the difference in the number of milliseconds between each of our levels. And finally, the residual is the same as before. Here, this particular data point has a y value of roughly 1140 milliseconds, 
but our model predicts it to be closer to 1090. Okay, you should now have a pretty good understanding of linear regression with both continuous and categorical predictors. Now we can move on to the actual R code and how to create these models. Starting with our mathematical equation, again, we can directly translate this into R code. We'll start with our example of the chick weight. The call in R for a linear model is LM. Then you rate the Y value, in our case, chick weight, and then a tilde, and then our X value, in our case, time. That's all you need to write. R does the rest to give you the remaining parts of the equation. To look at the output, we call summary of our model. I'll show you how to do this in more detail in the lab below. But first, let's look at the output. In the output, we're able to pull out most of the rest of our variables in our model. Our intercept is the number listed for the estimate of the intercept line in the model. We see here that our intercept is roughly 27 grams. We can also see B, or our slope, by looking at the estimate for time, since time is our independent variable. We see here that for each day that passes, a chick gains roughly 9 grams. To look at our residuals, we also have another call, resid, on our model. I've only printed out the first few residuals. We can see here they are ordered by number of data points. So we see here the residual for the first data point is roughly 15 grams. Now we can do the same thing with our example of a categorical predictor. As before, the call in R begins with LM. Then we write our Y variable, in this case reaction time, tilde, our X variable, in this case, type of bilinguals, high or low L2 proficiency. Looking at the summary of the model, we get the rest of the values in our equation. The intercept here is roughly 950 milliseconds, which means the value of our default level, or high proficiency, is 950 milliseconds. And looking at the estimate of our X value, type, shows us the difference between levels is roughly 147 milliseconds. As before, we call resid to look at our residuals. And again, here's the first six, and we see that for our first data point, the residual is roughly negative 18 milliseconds. Okay, now we'll start the actual coding in R for this lesson's lab. The data for this lesson comes from the United States Social Security Administration on baby names. The data looks at how popular a given name was for a girl or boy within a given year. I've downloaded the data from the R package baby names. We'll be asking two questions today with this lab, one with a continuous predictor and one with a categorical predictor. First, does your personal name get more or less popular between the years 1901 and 2000? And second, is your name more or less popular with females or males? So first, let's go over what each part of these models looks like. We'll start with our continuous predictor. Feel free to pause the video now and think about the answer for each of these before clicking play for the answers. Our Y1 value is the frequency of our name, or how popular it is in the population. Our A, or intercept, we don't know. We'll get that from our model. Our B, or slope, we also don't know. We'll get that from our model. Our XI is a given year. And finally, our residual, we also don't know. We'll get that from our model. Okay. Moving on to our categorical predictor. Here we have our variables. Again, feel free to pause the video if you'd like to think about the answers for each of these. Our Y1 is still the frequency of our name. This is the same across the two models. Our A, we don't know, we'll get it from our model. Our B, we don't know, we'll get it from our model. Our X is sex, female or male. And our residual, we don't know, we'll get it from our model. Okay, pause the video now and do the lab described in the text below. When you finish the lab, come back to the video for some food for thought for the next lesson. At the end of the lab, you should have a figure something like this, only for your name. My figure is a little cleaned up, so it may not look exactly the same as yours. The code for how to make a figure like this is available online. In the lab, we found that for Paige, there was no effective year. But we actually have two variables in this data set, year and sex. So let's see what happens when we color our data points by sex. Now it's starting to seem like we have clear groupings of data points that vary over time. Here the salmon color is for females and the turquoise for males. So what would happen if we did two separate linear regressions, one for each sex over time? 
Now we can see that there's a clear effective year, but it's different for each sex. For females, the name Paige became more popular over time, and for males, less popular. This looks like a pretty standard interaction. In the next lesson, we'll go over how to handle data sets when you want to look at two variables at the same time, and particularly, interaction between those two variables.